This is going to be a little bit of a, a why debris characterization matters to implant companies and everybody with an implant. So uh, here's a little bit of a lampooning the uh, uh, concern about this over the past 40 years where the only real development seemed to be um, the uh, language that we all use is a little more vulgar now than. Um, so uh, implant debris reactivity is the main reason for implant failure over time. That's no surprise, everybody knows that. But there are others, bone fracture, infection, implant fracture, but aseptic osteolysis or loosening is the main reason for implant failure over the long term, about 75% of the time. And within that little 75%, uh, about 1 to 5% are hypersensitivity or excessive reactivity to implant debris. And the other is just your normal everyday response to implant debris that builds up slowly over time. So these are the four areas that I'll try to go over as quickly as possible in the limited amount of time you have available. So uh, how and what kind of debris are produced is what we'll go over first. And uh, there's really only two mechanisms of debris being produced through wear and corrosion and there's only really two different types of implant debris which is uh, particulate and ionic and both of those need to be characterized for different types of implants so uh, wear is the main mechanism in articulating bearings of uh, how much uh, uh, particulate and soluble debris is produced is everything okay okay so what are the effects of implant debris? They are um, mostly local. There is systemic distribution of implant debris around the body, but most of it stays local and so are the effects. And this is the normal type of effect they have over the long term. Uh, granuloma, which is an immune response, a uh, buildup of uh, immune cells that slowly invade the bone interface, create a little inflammation that leads to subsequent loosening or um, pain and or pain. And so this uh, biologic reactivity to implant debris is part of a normal immune response where uh, macrophages, immune cells, are part of the normal players. And here is a kind of complex diagram of the sequence of events that happen where there are both um, uh, adaptive immunity and innate immune cells. Different parts of uh, immune system reactivity are involved with this particle reactivity, but for the most part, it's um, this macrophage uh, reactivity that's going on right there that causes the granulomatous type responses that slowly invade the bone interface. So um, this is the type of reactivity that you see in tissues where there's cytokines that are being expressed. Little uh, inflammation, inflammatory mediators are released and causes that um, bone destruction over the long term. All mediated by debris. So how is debris characterized? There's a couple of guidelines, ASTM and ISO guidelines to, to um, guide us in that that are fairly vague, but um, when we do it, we end up producing these little reports that look like this that have a whole bunch of stuff on them, distributions of size based on number and um, volume. And so why is this all this malarkey needed when you just want to need one particle size to submit that to the FDA? And the reason is you can have quite different distributions with the same average particle size that would have different types of biologic reactivity if you were to inject those in vivo. And not only that, but you have um, completely different shapes of particles, but these two have the same volume, so there's, they have the same equivalent spherical diameter. Also, they can have, if you injected a bunch of these guys versus a bunch of those guys, they would have quite different biologic reactivities. We're getting to why all that malarkey is necessary there. So there's a couple of different methods of characterizing debris. And so we use both laser diffraction and scanning electron microscopy to give us different uh, things. Laser diffraction gives us both size based on total volume, size based on total number. So from a biologic reactivity perspective, you're interested in the size based on total number 
because that's the smallest kind of debris that you can characterize and represents a worst case to the FDA. From an SEM, scanning electron microscopy standpoint, you can get both the shape and composition and the size based on a total number distributions. But if you want to look at how much of your debris is actually within the size that cells can phagocytose and create an immune response to, then you want this volume distribution because that will eliminate all these larger particles. 100 microns and larger are 10 times larger than cells, so they're a little less reactive than the smaller particles. So uh, not only do you, can you get the size and shape, but you can also look at what the particles are composed of, which also has big ramifications. Uh, this is cobalt debris, and this is uh, chromium phosphate corrosion debris. And as you noticed in a lot of metal on metal failures, or you might not be aware of, but there was a lot of cobalt being released from those implants from the bulk alloy and the debris looked a little more like this than it did like that and these are failing in great numbers and so uh, being attuned to what kind of debris is produced is also important. So what do you do with this information? You relate it back to predicate devices such as um, how much total wear is produced from the device, what are the particle sizes, and then from that you get measures of total numbers of particles that are being disseminated and you could possibly have some sort of reaction to. And, and this allows nice comparison to other devices that are out there, implants. So what is the most reactive kind of implant debris in this time? I'm just, I'm just going to go over some general rules of thumb when it comes to that very quickly. Um, it's no surprise that the greater amount of um, debris there is, the more the reactivity there is. That's, that's a no-brainer. Um, what isn't so evident is that larger size debris have more reactivity than smaller size debris if there's the same number of them. So um, that's kind of represented pictorially here and if you were going to be injected with one of those groups or the other, you can see how just having a little bit would be more than having a lot. But uh, from a uh, FDA perspective and a bioreactivity perspective, if your implant generates large particles, then there's just going to be a few large particles. If your implant generates small particles, there's going to be billions of them. So for an equal amount of mass, smaller particles are worse. And this is why you kind of gravitate towards what's the smallest size debris and characterize it all as that without going too small into some sort of Transli transmission electron microscopy and looking for nanometer sized debris because um, and focusing too much on the smaller particles as well. And uh, more chemically reactive debris uh, such as metals are generally more bioreactive than um, more inert debris, more chemically resistant debris like polymers. And uh, shape does matter as well. Uh, particles that are elongated and are more bioreactive than particles that have a nice round shape aspect ratio less than four. And the uh, uh, extreme example of that is asbestos, which is about as bad as you can get when particles fracture along their uh, longitudinal axis. Asbestos just keeps fracturing smaller and smaller and smaller and it gets uh, into a longer and longer fiber and you can't get rid of it and it punctures your cells. So here's some cells very happy with a lot of round particles and just a few of these asbestos fibers is enough to start killing those cells and puncturing them. So it's uh, size, shape, amount, and composition that matters when it comes to this kind of particle reactivity. And um, that all plays into this macrophage response that limits the lifetime of implants, so it is uh, likely to become more of an issue over time that the uh, FDA and regulatory agencies focus on and not less of one. And here is a little cell trying to eat a big particle, which is how we feel most of the time when